Question 6 from the 2019 Advanced Higher Physical Examination from the SQA. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. The equivalence principle is a key part of this theory. And for one mark, we're asked to state what is meant by the equivalence principle. Well, according to Albert Einstein, the equivalence principle is this. It is impossible for an observer to tell if he or she is in a gravitational field or an accelerating frame of reference. Now we can go to our little simulation and see this for real. We can see that the woman is on the planet Earth. She's in a gravitational field uh, on the surface of the planet Earth. She's in a room. She doesn't know she's there. But when she drops the ball from her hand, it accelerates downwards and hits the ground. So she concludes that it's a force of gravity pulling the ball towards the ground accelerating the ball towards the ground. Now for the astronaut, he's in a situation where he's going to be in an accelerating reference frame. Now he's glued or velcroed to the floor of the spacecraft. He can't move from the floor. He's got to be velcroed there in order to walk about the floor of the spacecraft. But in front of him is, this, is another red ball. And when he fires the engine, then what happens is, according to him, the ball accelerates downwards towards the floor. He doesn't know he's accelerating, but he notices that the ball is accelerating down towards the floor. So for all he knows, he could be in a gravitational field on the planet Earth if the acceleration measures to be 9.8 metres per second every second. So in other words, there is no difference between something in a gravitational field and a frame of reference which is accelerating. In other words, there's no difference between gravity and acceleration. And that really is the equivalence principle, which is an amazing thought for Albert Einstein. There it is there. So for one mark, you just have to learn that. And it is impossible for an observer to tell if he or she is in a gravitational field or an accelerating frame of reference. And I'll give you one mark. Question 6b. Space-time diagrams are used to show the world lines of objects. A space-time diagram represents the world lines of two objects, P and Q, and it's shown in figure 6a. Now, for one mark, we're asked to state which of these objects is accelerating through space-time. Well, we can see that for the world line of P, it is accelerating because its position is not evenly spread out. For example, if we take a certain uh, time here and go across, then the corresponding time will be down here. Corresponding position will be down here. If we go the equal time, then we can see that the corresponding position is down here. And equal time again, we can see the corresponding position is not the same as this position here, the gap between these positions. So obviously the object is, is decelerating, it's got negative acceleration. Even if we go to our next spaced out time, we can see the position, in fact, is getting even closer. So because the positions are not evenly spaced out, we conclude that that particular world line of the object is an object which world line is accelerating. So object is accelerating through space-time. So that's the one which we're going to pick, this one here. P is going to be accelerating. The world line of Q, well, you can see it's a constant gradient, which means that the position through as time progresses upwards, the position is moving to the right and it's going to be moving with the same gap in between. So therefore, Q is the world line of an object which has got constant speed through space-time. Question 6b, part 2. On figure 6a, draw a world line that would represent a stationary object. Well, a stationary object means its position does not change through time. So if you're going to have one of these lines shown like this, See the object's position was here. Then as time progresses, you're going to get a straight line all the way up the time axis like that. That is the world line of an object which is staying still, which is stationary. Question 6 continued, Part C. General relativity explains the space-time curvature caused by a black hole. This curvature causes a ray of light to appear to be deflected, and this is known as gravitational lensing. And you can see what's happening here. You can see the star 
The ray of light comes off the star straight, but as it approaches the black hole, because the black hole is so massive that it distorts space-time, the ray of light is bent round like that. So if you're an observer here, you think that the star is actually in its position here. Now the angle of deviation theta, as was shown in the diagram, is measured in radians and is given by a relationship that theta equals 4, capital G, capital M, divided by R, C squared. Now we know what G and M and R and C is because we're told that in the question. Capital G is the universal constant of gravitation. Capital M is the mass of the black hole and R is the distance between the black hole and the ray of light. And C is the speed of light in a vacuum. Now for part I says, imaging of the region around a black hole shows an angle of deflection of 0.047 radians when a ray of light is 1.54 times 10 to the power 6 metres from the black hole. And we have to determine the mass of the black hole. So we start by putting down an equation for it. Uh, we know that theta is going to equal to 4 capital G capital M divided by R C squared and we have got to find this part here the m part which will highlight like that so cross multiply and we have got theta r c squared is going to equal to 4 g m and remember still after that mass of black hole that's we've got to rearrange the formula into so we divide both sides by 4 g to get the m on its own and we have theta r c squared divided by 4 times universal gravitational constant is going to equal to the mass of the black hole. So that's really our formula and all we have to do is just really plug in our numbers to that one then. So the mass of the black hole is going to be m and it's going to be equal to first of all theta which is 0 0.0487 multiplied by the distance the light beam is away from the black hole which is 1.54 times 10 to the power 6 metres, and then times the speed of light squared. And be very careful, it's speed of light squared, so you have to square the speed of light. And we're dividing that all by uh, 4 times the universal gravitational constant. And the universal gravitational constant from the data book is 6.67 times 10 to minus 11. So if you do that on your calculator, you end up with a value for the black hole, and the black hole's mass is 2.53 times 10, and it's going to be to the power 31, and it's going to be kilograms. So it's just a case of rearranging the equation and being very careful, plugging in the numbers, and making sure you don't make a mistake on your calculator. Question 6c e continued, part 2. Gravitational lensing causes the deflection of light rays from background stars that appear close to the edge of the sun. This phenomenon can be observed during a total solar eclipse. It can be shown that the angle of deflection theta and radians of a ray of light by a star of mass m is related to the Schwarzschild radius of the star and the distance r between the ray of light and the centre of the star. And it's given by the formula theta equals 2r, 2r where r is the Schwarzschild radius, divided by r, which is the distance between the ray of light and the centre of the star. So here we have a kind of picture of what's happening here. We have the star, we have a ray of light coming near the sun, grazing the sun, and then being bent by the warped space-time round the sun. And if you're an observer here, then the star would appear to come from here deviate it by an angle of theta. But in ordinary cases, you wouldn't be able to see that star because the sun would be blocking it out. And it was really quite fortunate that in 1915 he had this solar eclipse, which, which effectively took the sun out so you could see the position of the star there. And then you could go back and look six months later and see the position of the star, where it really was compared to the background stars. And therefore, we could detect that light is bent in space-time, where there's a heavy mass uh, of the mass of the sun in space-time. So the formula is given by theta equals 2r times Schwarzschild radius divided by r. So all we have to do is really mark that down. So we go theta is equal to 2 times 
the Schwarzschild radius, which is called RS for short, divided by R, which is the distance from the centre of the sun to the ray of light as it just skims the surface. And you can see that just there like that, so that will be the radius of the sun. So we have to go and look up our data book, and there's our data book here. And we have to go and find the radius of the sun. And the radius of the sun there, the solar radius is called, uh, is marked there, is 6.955 times 10 to the power 8 metres. So we now know the radius of the of the sun. So we just need to put in the numbers to calculate this angle. So theta is going to equal to 2 times the Schwarzschild radius, which we're told is going to be 3 times 10 to the power 3. And it's going to be metres. So we put a bracket around that and divide by the radius of the sun, the solar radius, which is 6.955, multiplied by 10, and it's going to be, look up the data book there, it's going to be times 10 to the power 8. So we do that on our calculator. We end up with a value of 8.626 times 10 to the minus 6, and what's going to be the units? Well, the meters cancel out, these are meters here as well, so it cancels out. And because it's measured in radians, there's no unit for it, so we have to put down the radians. And that's an incredibly small uh, measure of an angle. So you're not going to get a big deflection, you're going to get a small deflection. So for two marks, that's all you have to do, find the radius of the sun and plug the numbers into the formula given there, and you've got your two marks. Question part B. On the axis below, sketch a graph showing the observed variation of the angle of deflection of a ray of light with its distance from the centre of the sun. Numerical values are not required on the axis. So here we have the situation here, and we know the formula from the previous case here that theta is going to equal to 2 times the Schwarzschild radius divided by r, and r is the distance of the light beam from the centre of the sun. So if we've got 2 times Rs, we know Rs is a constant for the sun. So we can write down then that theta is going to go to 2 times a constant, which we can just call a constant k divided by r. So therefore we know that theta then is directly proportional to 1 upon r. So as r becomes, or the light beam becomes further away from the centre of the sun, as r gets very big, then you can see that theta because you're dividing by a bigger number, it's going to become very small. So as r increases, then theta is going to become small. And we also know that we're going to have a maximum kind of value here, because when r is exactly equal to uh, the solar radius, we're going to get a maximum value, which we worked out in the previous question. We don't need to put numerical values in. And therefore, that will be starting some value up here. So we have a graph like this. We have the maximum angle at the solar radius, and then as we get increasing distance, the light beam gets increasing distance away from the centre of the sun, then the angle of deflection is going to come down with a very famous 1 upon r graph all the way along there like that. And you can see that as r gets very, very big, the angle theta gets very small and at the solar radius you've got that maximum value there which we worked out in the previous question and that's your graph. Mm -hmm.